So it wasn't our wires or anything. All right. We should all be on mute. As I traveled around the globe, I realized that the world was moving further into darkness. Many of the musicians and composers that I worked with and befriended in Europe were Jews. And when they and their children started disappearing, I visited the Warsaw ghettos in Poland to see where the Nazis put the niggers of their society. The world had moved further into darkness. Jews were being gassed and burned in Nazi Germany, while black men and boys swung from southern trees and set ablaze. Strange fruit indeed. The Spanish had a revolution. The French a resistance. Blacks and Jews just tried to stay alive. But unlike the Jew who could change his name and somewhat disguise his heritage, the global despise of all things black left us without sanctuary. Oh, the world had moved further into darkness. If we can accept the fatherhood of God, then why not the brotherhood of man? I say if God is our father, why can't men live as brothers? I retreated to London. And after nights playing off fellow on the English stage, I would spend my day studying linguistics at the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. I would have heated debates with brilliant young minds like Claude McKay, Kwame Nkrumah, and Jomo Kenyatta. Claude McKay was a Jamaican a novelist and a writer and a prominent figure during the Harlem Renaissance. He would share with me the socialist teachings of his mentor, Marcus Garvey. Kwame Nkrumah and Jomo Kenyatta were brilliant African students. They taught me firsthand of Africa. They would later lead African nationalist movements which led to the independence of their respective homelands. Kwame Nkrumah became the first president of an independent Ghana. And Jomo Kenyatta after being beaten and exiled and thrown in jail, returned to become the first president of Kenya after receiving their independence from Great Britain. And I became obsessed with Africa. I began to study her religions, her languages, her culture. You see, every nation had or wanted a piece of Africa at this time. It was the acquisition of Africa that helped make Great Britain great. But no nation, I repeat, no nation received as much from Africa as America. America received Africa's most precious cargo, her humanity. And no nation was more inhumane to Africa's children. America, it was the land of the free, the home of the slave. Oh, why doesn't that Paul Robeson just shut his mouth? He's rich, he lives in a mansion, we treat him well. I'd respond, 
And just because you treat me with some modicum of decency and respect, if you think that it'll excuse your mistreatment of 16 million of my brothers and sisters, then you are mistaken. Well, publicized confrontation with President Harry Truman when he invited me to sing at the White House. I brought with me an anti-lynching bill co-authored by my good friend Albert Einstein. Because young Negro soldiers, after returning home from World War II, after helping liberate European Jews from the Nazis, they were being dropped off in Port Authority at Grand Central Station, New York. And as they took Greyhound buses down, and they passed through segregated counties in Maryland, in Virginia, in Georgia, Florida, Texas, Louisiana, on their way home to the deep south in Mississippi and Alabama. They were being dragged off the buses and lynched with American military uniforms still on their backs. Young Negro soldiers having fought for a freedom they never knew swinging from a tree, the heart of a lion, the blood of a king, praying for an afterlife while they just steal this one. I became obsessed, and I began to see myself as a living, breathing symbol of all people of African descent. And I began to speak out about it at my concerts and everywhere I went, and that was the beginning of my troubles with the U.S. government. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Frank. You've just been listening and watching a marvelous uh, excerpt from Stoji Kenyatta's one-man show about Paul Robeson. I'm going to introduce everybody on the panel in just a second. We're very excited to have you here for the celebration and examination of Paul Robeson's life and career and how uh, that reaches into today. Um, before we start, just want to give you a little coming attraction. Uh, LA Made, on March 15th, we're going to be doing a program called Create Your Best Life via Journaling. Daryl Hausian, or Hassarian, uh, author of What If Godzilla Just Wanted a Hug, a title I wish I'd written. Um, and uh, he's doing a workshop on creating your best life via journaling. And uh, we have a lot of people here today who can probably tell you about feeling better be because of being writing, because of writing and being creative. What I'd like to do at this point is introduce these marvelous panelists, starting out with uh, the gentleman you just saw, Stoji Kenyoga, or Kenyatta, excuse me. Uh, Jamaican-born, Brooklyn-bred of Kenyan ancestry, actor, writer, director, Stoji has been a working artist for the last two decades, known for his lucrative touring one-man Broadway-style show on Paul Robeson. He trained at the Afro-American Studio in Harlem, the Henry Street Settlement, and the Alphonse Theatrical Ensemble, a finalist in the New York State competition with artistic director John Hausman, a scholarship athlete. He came west uh, to attend film school at California State University, studied privately with Ivan Makata at the Van Mar Academy for Television and Film Acting, has written and directed several short films and videos, has 32 or has 30 films and TV acting credits from soaps, movies, and sitcoms. Co headlined USO stand up comedy tour in Okinawa and Tokyo, Japan. Writer and artist of acclaimed one man Broadway style show, The World is My Home, The Life of Paul Robeson. The winner of the NAACP Theater Award for Best Solo Show. He's written several screenplays that are in different stages of development. Um, the God Stop Smiling, the urban basketball drama, and he will be directing his passion piece, the offbeat dark comedy, Promise of Paradise. 
In 2019, he guest starred in the international feature film, Joseph, about the, about the African 400 year of return, shot in Kingston, Jamaica, Cape Coast, and Accra, Ghana. Welcome, Stogie. Um, my next uh, panelist is Paul von Blum. He is a senior lecturer in communications and African American studies at UCLA. He's taught there since 1980, having previously taught at UC Berkeley for 11 years. He's received numerous awards for distinguished teaching and has taught a wide variety of classes, many involving the history of American social protest and the history of resistance against racism and other forms of injustice. He has lectured widely throughout the world and is a visiting professor at Masarak University in the Czech Republic. He's the author of 10 books and many an article including a wonderful short biography of Paul Robeson entitled Paul Robeson for Beginners. And he is a longtime civil rights and political activist and a member of the California Bar Association. Next panelist is Sharon Rudolph. Sharon marched with Martin Luther King as a teenager and began her career as a cartoonist with anti Vietnam War underground newspapers. She was one of the founders of the 1970s era feminist anthology, Women's Comics. Rudolph has contributed to scores of publications and participated in exhibitions in dozens of countries over the last 50 years. She's best known for her graphic biography, Emma Goldman, A Dangerous Woman. And finally, we are very privileged to have Susan Goldman Rubin. She grew up in the Bronx, dreamed of becoming an artist. She wrote and illustrated her first three picture books, then turned to writing nonfiction for young writers of all ages and focused on the arts, biographies, and themes of social justice. She is the author of more than 60 books, including The Quilts of G's Bend, a 2018 NCTE Orbis picture on her book, Mary Sicole, Bound for the Battlefield, a Bank Street College of Education's Best Children's Book of the Year, and Sing and Shout, The Mighty Voice of Paul Robeson, a bookless STEM scheme biography for young writers and Bank Street College of Education's Best Book of the Year. Ruben lives in Malibu, California. Welcome all. Thank you, John. Thank you, Thank you all. And, hey. Um, I should mention here, I just noticed it wasn't in my biography, but mentioning Sharon's wonderful book, Sharon Rudolph, uh, Ballad of an American, which is extraordinary. All these works, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> what I thought we'd start out with here, because I have all you people who seem to be doing the same thing, and it's kind of bringing Paul, the story of Paul Robeson to a more modern audience, making it more accessible to people. And what I wanted to start out with was just talking about, so, you know, starting from the beginning, who is he, who was he, and uh, what is it that drew you to study him? And whoever wants to start. Well, I'll start. Uh, we had a chance to chat before, and Stogie, your performance was fantastic. Sorry, I missed it live, but I want to see the whole clip. Because uh, you mentioned so many points that were so important. I had the chance to meet Paul Robeson when I went to the High School of Music and Art, the old one, in Harlem. And oh, at the oh. time, his his passport, had, it was the McCarthy era, and his passport had been revoked in 1950. And a group of students were asked to come and hear him speak. And when I left the apartment, my mother said, whatever you do, don't sign anything. So of course I did. There was a petition demanding that his passport be returned so that he could resume his career. And I like to think that my name is in the FBI file because his file was the largest, is the largest in the entire FBI. I'll just mention something more recently. Uh, my husband and I were in New York and went to an exhibit at the Whitney Museum. And it was by Steve McQueen. And he had Robeson's FBI file literally scrolling down on two ends of the hall with a voiceover, Stogie, is that what you'd call it? A voiceover, repeating the words. And I said, oh my God, 
I've got to write about this man. I know him. And I just want to say, as I told the group earlier, when we were getting acquainted, my parents saw him in Othello and never stopped talking about it. So it was a great honor to do this book. Oh, that's a wonderful story. Um, uh, I, as I've traveled around the world, I've met so many people that have met him. And it's been, um, uh, I was performing um, near the Guggenheim in New York at Central Park West. And um, uh, there's a segment in it, as uh, you'll see um, in, um, I think, the arts and culture segment where his son uh, went to Brown University and he fell in love with a nice Jewish girl. Right. And um, uh, he was getting married and he called Paul to tell him and Paul knew how much hell he'd caught. And he said, listen, um, uh, that might be a rough idea. You live in America. And he says, yeah, well, it doesn't matter. She's in love with me, too. OK. And he's like, he says, wait a minute, you're black. She's Jewish. He said, listen. And we said, we want to get married and have a baby. And he said, uh, you and that Jewish girl both live in America. And America is not fond of either one of you. <laughs> so after the show, um, I did this thing uh, in, the, in the sequence where um, Al Jolson, uh, a, a big Al Jolson sequence that uh, we played with Paul and the whole thing uh, me, uh, with Dizzy Gillespie and the, the, the gang. And um, an old lady came up to me and she, she looked like she was in her early hundreds. And she said, <laughs> thank you so much for the tribute that you gave to my, uh, my grandfather. I said, who's your grandfather? And he said, Al Al Jolson. And I said, oh, my God. So Al Jolson went and found himself a nice little Jewish girl, too. (laughs) He said, well, Al Jolson was Jewish. I said, no, he was a fair-skinned black man. And she insisted that he was Jewish, and he was from Brooklyn, and he wasn't black, that he did blackface. But I said, no, no, no. But I said, he's a fair-skinned black man, sort of a little bit lighter than Duke Ellington. And I was positive about this. And I, at that time, I'd been doing the show for around eight years, and no one had ever said to me, Al Jolson wasn't black. And I know at least 20 black people who would swear to you, Al Jolson was black. And I told them, I said, Al Jolson, it's not Benny Goodman. Jolson and Al Jolson almost sound as black as Count Basie. I <laughs> said, so, listen, Al Jolson. And so as it turns out, she was right. Al Jolson is uh, white. And uh, a Jewish guy from Brooklyn. And when I did New Orleans at the conservatory there, he said, like, he said, but Al Jolson was often considered to be black because you never swam around anybody but black people because they were like, only blacks and Jews play jazz music. And um, he couldn't that. But Al Jolson was always there. He carried the bebop, he wore the hair, he was like, and he was an honorary black person. But he said, but no, technically Al Jolson was a white Jewish guy from Brooklyn. And I said, oh, my God. And it was, I said, I almost argued with that poor lady. <laughs> so it was, uh, but it, it's been really, it, it's, it's been an education as you go along because uh, so many people, um, including some people whose grandfathers were in the FBI, and they would tell me stories that, you know, um, are in England and, uh, and, and trans um, uh, um, American expatriates that would say things like, um, when my dad, my grandfather was in the FBI, he said, oh, they're giving this poor guy so much trouble. They tapped his phone, they do so much. They're trying to, you know, and so, uh, so it's crazy. So, uh, so I really do appreciate your story. And I love that um, there's music and arts. My sister went there. Um, I uh, was performing arts, but I didn't, um, you know, I didn't have a basketball team. It was, you know, uh, it wasn't cool back then. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, but it's, uh, but that, that's a wonderful story. So yeah, I, I, I'm really glad you heard it. Thank you. Now, I grew up uh, always knowing Paul Robeson. My parents uh, told me that they introduced me to him in 1948 when I was five at the Progressive Party convention in Philadelphia uh, during the uh, uh, Henry Wallace campaign. Uh, and uh, Paul Robeson was uh, deeply involved in the uh, insurgent the Wallace campaign in 48. Uh, but uh, I uh, was a young person in the civil rights movement uh, in the SNCC uh, in Georgia and Alabama and Louisiana, and uh, kind of everybody I knew, uh, uh, mostly African Americans and uh, the white supporters, everybody knew Robeson, except the rest of the world did not. Uh, and uh, as I went through my university studies and then had the fortune, the good fortune of becoming university teacher myself, 
uh, it dawned on me that uh, the uh, vast and overwhelming majority of my students had never heard of Paul Robeson. Uh, and I knew that uh, Paul Robeson was America's greatest Renaissance person. And in 1998, at the centennial of his birth, uh, I had the opportunity of speaking widely in the United States um, and uh, really throughout the world. Uh, and I remember saying that, and I was interviewed by the New York Times, and the reporter said, are you sure, uh, Mr. Von Blum, that you really want to say that he's the greatest Renaissance person in the world? And I looked at the New York uh, Times reporter and said, I don't say what I don't mean. And I absolutely mean what I said. He is, in fact, the greatest Renaissance person ever uh, with his multi-talented uh, efforts in every conceivable field. Uh, and then uh, I decided uh, when I left Berkeley for UCLA and I joined the African-American Studies Department that I would initiate an entire course on Paul Robeson. And I think, I'm not entirely sure, but I think I did the uh, first entire university course on the life and times of Paul Robeson. And people mm -hmm. said, you can do an entire 10 week course on Robeson. And I said, absolutely not. There's no way I can encapsulate the life of Paul Robeson in 10 weeks. I would need 20 weeks, 30 weeks, maybe two entire years. That's how I know Paul Robeson. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, I feel really overawed by my fellow panelists. I knew very little about Paul Robeson when I began my, my graphic biography. Um, a man I've worked with for many years on, on progressive uh, topics was approached by Rutgers University on the centennial of, of Robeson's graduation from Rutgers that Rutgers wanted to fund the creation of a graphic biography. And I only knew of Robeson as a sort of golden icon of, of the progressive era of my parents. I think my parents were probably more liberal than they ever let on. I was not a red diaper baby. They were very careful. We were Jews holed up in the McCarthy era when people were being uh, fired and driven to suicide right and left by, by the red baiting. We had uh, a family living next to us that was in hiding so the little boys couldn't go to school because their parents had uh, connections with the Communist Party or supposedly did. Anyways, I knew Robeson as like the sort of iconic figure from a, a Renaissance painting of a martyr or something and I was approached with the possibility of doing the job and I, I just grabbed it. I knew it was something I wanted to learn about. So my experience was almost like a, a, an arranged marriage. There I was thrown together with Paul Robeson and a year and a half or two years to find out everything I could about him and somehow try to transmit it to the world. I fell in love. I didn't fall in love like a young woman, although he was undoubtedly, along with all his other Renaissance abilities, one of the handsomest and sexiest <laughs> and most charismatic men that ever lived, that everyone who came anywhere near him fell in love with. But I fell in love with him more like as my grandchild. When something bad would happen to him, I'd be outraged. I'd want to go back in time and slap the people around that, that mistreated him. When he achieved something, I was so proud of him and so happy for him. When, when you know, little things like his his father going back to visit his mother who was still in slavery. I, I broke down in tears when I learned about it. So it was, it was uh, I hope it transmits itself a little bit in the work that my own excitement and discovery and how new, I, I think I'm an example of someone who even of the generation of civil rights activists knew very, very little about Paul Robeson. He was really downplayed uh, with the radicals I worked with as being maybe too appealing to white audiences and, and not clearly radical enough. I don't think he was uh, really appreciated and understood in that era. And I think we need him more than ever now today. I'm so happy to hear that all of you are, are helping bring his story to light. I think we need it we need it more than anything to learn to work together again. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, uh, could I, um, um, well, you mentioned some things, but I'll talk to you about that later uh, that I did not know. But one of the reasons um, touring uh, and, and having intellectuals bring the universities around the world is that um, one of the reasons he's so unpopular uh, for his achievement was that not only whites, but some Blacks were uncomfortable with, with Black intelligentsia. And um, as uh, there's a, a piece, um, a segment in the show when uh, Paul is depressed uh, after going through the whole thing with Stalin, the whole thing in the Black Ball, and, um, and uh, he gets depressed uh, having mood swings. And Langston Hughes, his good friend, comes by, who also went to Columbia University at that time, uh, another brilliant uh, African American artist. And uh, he said to him, uh, which is in my play, um, that 
It's not that the Negro people don't love you, Paul. They just don't have the intellect to understand you. He says, you're a valedictorian with a law degree. They're lucky if they got a, a year of high school. So if you speak half a dozen languages, you've traveled around the world a half a dozen times, you know? Um, uh, who they know like you, Paul? You know, who they know like you? He says, not that they don't love you. you they just don't have that intellect to understand it. You're too smart for the room. And he says, it's a dangerous place to be, a lonely place to be, a stranger amongst your own people in your own land. But you're too smart for the room, Paul. Too smart for the room. That's true. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, so it, it's unique because um, uh, when he graduated from law school, it was 1922. This is eight years before the Great Depression. And America, for all intents and purposes, was an illiterate nation of immigrants. And here you have this African American, not only was he magna cum laude, valedictorian, and the third African American to get an academic scholarship, but he went to law school, which, you know, it's like right now if Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, and Michael Jordan all not only graduated from college, you know, as valedictorian, but then went on to law school. And that's what Paul did, you know. And while he was there, uh, his final year, he played in the early NFL. He played four years in the NFL before uh, the formation of the two leagues. So he, he's without a doubt the ultimate renaissance man. And Paul, you were right, because um, that is how I first heard of you. Um, the late uh, Dr. Barbara Robinson from UCLA, the head of the drama department. That yeah. woman, she was like, there's a Paul Rose in the story. You know, of course, and I was like, get out of here. I said, what's your brother's name? And he said, Paul Von Bloom. I said, that's a strange name for a brother. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Beverly and I were good friends. Uh, so, no, I know. Uh, uh, Paul was absolutely incredible. You know, I, I have fun with my class. I have the picture of the graduating class of uh, Rutgers Law School, and I hold it up and I say, here's the easiest question you're ever going to have. In <laughs> Who can find Paul Robeson? It is so enormously easy. Uh, that is one face you're not going to have any difficulty in finding. <laughs> And, uh -oh. and the Columbia Law School picture as well. Yes. Very right. easy. Very easy. I want to oh, yeah. say something yeah. about just recently really drove home to me how much he still disappeared uh, on the death of Sidney Poitier and all the adulation about that and all the shows about that. Sidney Poitier was consistently one of Robeson's strongest supporters and always praised Robeson for opening doors for him. And they had all this stuff about Sidney Poitier opening doors. Like nobody ever opened the door before. There wasn't a single word about Robeson in any of it. Sharon, the not a word. Yeah, not a word. Sidney Poitier was a giant, was a giant, and he deserved the adulation that he got. But for all of those wonderful tributes to Sidney Poitier, nobody said, nobody said that Sidney Poitier stood on the shoulders of Paul Robeson. But and Sidney Poitier always credited Robeson with that. He always, he always stood up for him, even at the always. darkest times, and spoke out for him. And always. Robeson mentored. I. I included in my book that Robeson mentored Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier when yes. they were starting out and said, don't go too overboard because it'll hurt your careers. And Harry Belafonte wrote a wonderful preface to my book. I was so touched and moved. Oh, and he said yeah, of what a mentor uh, Robeson was, not only in his values and his message, but in his shepherding and his mentoring saying, don't go too far. Look what happened to me. I don't want you guys to get into trouble. You know, Paul, I don't know if you were part of Freedom Summer, but I did a book about Freedom Summer in Mississippi when Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier came down to Mississippi with the satchel of cash and were so terrified leaving town that that led to that movie in the heat of the night. I'm, I'm aware of it. I was in, I was in Alabama and, and uh, Louisiana. Well, Deployed I in different places, but no. Look, when when uh, I heard about the death of the three uh, young men, it hit me like a ton of bricks because I had been in Neshoba County. Uh, I uh, I had the honor of uh, introducing Harry when he was our guest at UCLA, uh, and I talked to Harry. I gave him a copy of one of my articles. Harry never stood back. Uh, he did what he had to do, uh, and he understood. He was Robeson's greatest. Uh, greatest uh, 
acolyte, really. Uh, and uh, just like Sidney Poitier, he understood that it was Paul Ropes and above all, the greatest original black film star in the entire history of the film industry. Uh, and Sidney Poitier, like Harry Belafonte, acknowledged Paul Robeson. And I think uh, the recent press coverage was tremendously deficient uh, in failing to acknowledge Paul Robeson. Uh, I think they did a tremendous disservice uh, to American history in, in that it failure. Just, to me, it just shows how much there still is political pressure. Not If they admit how important Paul Robeson is, then maybe people will start thinking about his political ideas and entertaining the possibilities we could work together to have a, get rid of capitalism or some little thing like that. So they weren't going to take a chance of bringing that up to anybody's mind. Yeah, the Aaron, they'll never go that far. <laughs> At the end of my shows, because uh, one of the questions I ask is, why did you choose Robeson? And I tell him that uh, he's the most important person in the 20th century. And I said, uh, he not only exceeded in every aspect that African Americans have made us wealthy, wealthy and successful, which was um, entertainment, athletics, and law and social justice, which Robeson touched all the bases, uh, top shelf. But I explained to him, I said, without Paul Robeson, we would have never had Barack Obama as president. And some people right. think, well, that's a bit of a stress because we never met. But then I explained to him, I said, Robeson went in his heyday, mentored Belafonte and uh, his best friend, Sidney Portier. And when him, Robeson, and Bill Bojangles Robinson went to see Branch Rickey about letting an African American player join the Brooklyn Dodgers, Robeson, Belafonte, and Portier came to Pasadena. California to get the great grandson of a Texas Louisiana slave named Jackie Robinson and brought him there. And then Jackie Robinson became a mentee of Robeson as well. He taught him many things, but among them, three things in particular. He taught him number one, he said, the Education is the key to life and to advancement. He said, Educated populations do less damage to their fellow human beings because they're educated. Okay. The second thing he taught him, was that the continental African and the African American are one people. And he also taught him, he said, every successful African American has a moral and a cultural obligation to try to make, get a quality education for Africans on the continent. So they started this foundation with Robeson's blessing to pay for college scholarships for qualified African students. But first they had to find a university that would accept them. All of the lowest 48 states says, now we're good. We don't want any black kids, Africans coming here. We don't care who's paying for them. But our newest state was Hawaii. And Hawaii said, well, we've just joined America. We haven't learned to hate anybody yet. And we're kind of proud of ourselves. <laughs> we're working on it. So you could send them here, okay? So they said, fine. So Belafonte 48 went off to Africa, started in West Africa, and all the way through Central Africa, all the way to East Africa. The requirements were you had to speak fluent English, be a high school graduate, and you had to pass the college entrance examination test. They went all the way through Africa, and they found in 18 African nations, 72 students that they would then fly to the University of Hawaii to study there under this program wow. that they had. Wow. And among those students was a brilliant Muslim boy who was very good in the math and sciences from the mountainsides of Kenya. And that young boy's name was none other than Barack Obama. And oh, that was yeah. Barack Obama's I dad who got to the University yeah. of Hawaii. Yeah. Oh, you know, I didn't know that. Yeah, oh. There's all these incredible linkages, Stoji. I'm so glad that you also mentioned uh, Jackie Robinson. Uh, right. Because uh, in 1943, yes. uh, during his successful run of Othello on Broadway, uh, Robeson also led a delegation to the uh, commissioner of Major League Baseball, uh, uh, Judge uh, Landis. Uh, long before Robinson broke the color line uh, with the Brooklyn Dodgers, Robeson was politically involved, politically involved in the agitation to break the color line in baseball. So Robeson uh, was not only a great athlete himself, he took that uh, athletic prowess and he turned it into sports advocacy. You know, there's Colin Kaepernick, which is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But the tradition of the athlete, the great athlete, becoming involved in sports advocacy 
for progressive causes goes back. And Robeson is one of the originators of that yeah. remarkable tradition. Robeson did it. It took years before baseball finally broke its segregation. And, and, uh, and I don't and think we get to, Jackie uh, Robinson sold Robeson out to the House on American Affairs Committee. That can't be forgotten either. No, it shouldn't be forgotten, but he later apologized for uh, for his capitulation to McCarthyite hysteria. Uh, well, it shows uh, how hard I, the press was, but nonetheless. I, I, I actually uh, saw I'll get back to that, but I'm saying it, it breaks my heart that uh, baseball doesn't acknowledge uh, Robeson's role in getting Jackie into the league. Yes. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. 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 It also uh, is bad that the NFL doesn't acknowledge that uh, he was one of the early NFL players uh, that came in before the the, the Ford. Well, they blotted out a lot of his records for decades and decades. He didn't all yeah. the books that listed all the achievements. They just took Robeson's name out of it. A lot of them yeah. just got put back in the last few decades. And in regards to Jackie Robinson having to apologize for working with the feds when they were putting pressure on him, I don't think he ever has to apologize for that at all. Because, number one, he was not politically astute, okay? He was a baseball player, okay? And he was much, much younger than Robeson at that time. And Robeson did not want to lose his career and to undo all the progress they've made by getting him in the league, by getting him kicked out, for trying to stand up for something that was not going to change. Okay, we are 12, 13 percent of the population right now. Back then, we may have been five or four percent. Okay, no one gave a damn. Jackie's voice would not have changed one darn thing as far as the House American Activities Committees. Okay, Paul Robeson would still have been the most dangerous man in America, according to them. So my thing is, is this, Jackie? If you if you look at it, what was this young athlete who was not politically astute, did not know the machinations of it, going to do? And the thing is, the kind of pressure that they put on him to play ball, and everybody else was saying, including all of the African-American population at that time, because they didn't know either, okay? And they were like, Jackie, just play ball, do what these people want, or they will throw you in jail and ruin your life and everything. And so Jackie did what was best for his family at that time, and I don't think he owes any apology at all, okay? It's the system that did it, the system that created it. Yeah. They well, put I, kind of pressure on him. But Robeson never, never would have done it. Robeson never would have done it. I mean, there's, there's, there's humans, and then there's superior humans, and Robeson was a superior right. human. Robeson also wasn't 23 years old, and he also wasn't that young. And Robeson was prepared for it. He went through his, his, his father was a runaway slave. He came, got it. He, he used it. They murdered his brother Reeves on the streets. Okay, no one has ever charged with a murder. He says, "Come get the body. We're going to throw it in Potter's Field." Okay, what about who killed him? It doesn't matter, okay? There are a lot of things Robeson did. He put Marion Anderson through school. He sent a lot of African American singers to Juilliard. He did countless things there that you know that he never got the credit for. They also don't mention how close he was with Dr. Albert Einstein, who was one of his dearest friends, and who wrote that anti-lynching bill with him that he took to President Harry Truman. Uh, this was Dr. Albert Einstein. Doc, one of the nicest stories is that Robeson. <laughs> And Dr. Albert Einstein threw a surprise birthday party for W.E.B. Du Bois. And it was so uh, it, it, It's amazing. But I'm just saying the level of intellect at that time, okay, because this was the darkest period in human history, okay? Not once but twice. The entire globe got together and said, hey, let's choose sides and go kill the other half of the world. Not once but twice. Two world wars within... 20 years apart. Yeah, I know. 97 million dead. Conservative estimate, by the way, because we're not going to count Hiroshima. <laughs> we're facing in Ukraine now. It could be the same thing again. Right. You know what I mean? So, so the, vanish in the last century. People are still lining up to do the same kind of stupid things. But I, one of the stories that I thought was important to include was how he decided that he was going to this to Spain during the Spanish Civil War. And he was going to sing to the troops. And his wife, who we have to talk about, Essie, said, you know, oh, yeah. in so many words, are you nuts? <laughs> you know, you're risking your life. And he said, I'm going. She said, I'll go with you. <laughs> you know, she was right there. And I, you may know the story. I really loved including this in my book, how he set up, he went to the battlefield and he set up loudspeakers so that both sides, the loyalists and the fascist rebels, could hear him. And for one day, the war stopped, and he sang Old Man River. 
and everybody wept and cheered. And I think that's just fabulous. In fact, his granddaughter, Susan, did a picture book. John, you may have it in your library, of the day grandpa stopped the war. And literally, that's exactly what he did. But that's just one instance of many. You're telling some stories that I didn't even know about. Marvelous. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, Susan's book, um, He Had the Whole World in His Hands, is where I got the title for my show, The World is My Home. Oh. And uh, in my homeland, my birth uh, land, uh, Kingston, Jamaica, they named the U.S. Embassy the Paul Robeson Center uh, for Humanity, and they had Susan come down to christen it. Um, I was, uh, I wish I was there because I, 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 my travels, I, you know, I never actually got to meet her. Um, I did meet his son uh, in Brooklyn, his grandson, and I met his great grandson in Saint Croix, Virgin Islands, when I performed there. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was. Uh, He's, he's from, he lives in St. Croix. And so, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's, an, it's an amazing, amazing journey and um, uh, uh, a magnificent life. I mean, um, the amount of things that he did, you know, it's, uh, and that's uh, unparalleled, unparalleled. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you're dealing with, with the stratosphere. Right. <laughs> you're dealing with the ropes and you really are. I mean, I, um, I, I I had an opportunity, um, you know, maybe 15, 18 years ago to talk to his son, Paul Robeson Jr., who fortunately has passed away. Uh, I had breakfast with him uh, and uh, his wife, Marilyn, and we had a we had a wonderful breakfast in which I expressed uh, my my critique of Robeson uh, for his uh, kind of uncritical view of uh, Stalinism. It was a gentle critique, uh, but a strong one. Uh, and uh, Paul Jr. disagreed with me, but it's the kind of thing that I really like in the intellectual arena, where people can disagree with one another and remain remarkably friendly with one another and enjoy each other's company. I would like to see a hell of a lot more of that because it seems to be so remarkably rare. And, uh, and Paul's wife, Marilyn, uh, was just a wonderful, wonderful human being. Uh, and she told me one of the nicest compliments uh, I, I've had. When she heard me speak uh, at the Robeson Conference, she said it reminded her of his little girl uh, when people in New York uh, were giving these rabble-rousing rou speeches uh, in Union Square. So uh, I took that uh, as a tremendous compliment. Uh, my uh, rabble-rousing abilities uh, honed uh, in the civil rights movement uh, and, uh, that I try to also uh, reflect uh, continually, even now as a university teacher. I wanted us to take a second. John? I wanted us to take a second and talk a little bit about his wife, because as, as, as I was reading the, the uh, everybody's books and everything that was that was the big discovery for me really well his family you know disapproved of her his family disapproved of her initially because they thought she was very pushy too practical her temperament was very different than his and she i read her own uh memoir and she said she was out to get him he was the darling of harlem and he would be hers <laughs> And so her plan was set. And when she made up her mind to do something, she did it. And in fact, her mother had been very active in the suffrage movement, which uh, was just many black people, many black women were pushed out of the suffrage movement. And uh, Aslanda's mother was very active and disapproved of Paul. She thought he was too dark and might not amount to much of anything. And <laughs> Aslanda saw his potential and she was the one who encouraged him to take that first acting job when he had graduated law school and was kind of unsure. He kept saying, oh, something will come along. Something will come along. And she said, no, now. <laughs> Very pushy. <laughs> actually, was, Susan, uh, oh, go on. Uh, but you're, you're absolutely right. Um, he would never have thought a life on the stage as a performer to him because um, he, he grew up in the church. So every Sunday I go to church, I see 25 great black singers, okay? Uh, you can throw a beer over your shoulder and it'll splash on nine great black singers. <laughs> but you could, look up, you could look 
for a mile and find a great black lawyer. So he didn't go to law school because his quote was when she wanted to sing, which I used to myself, he said, I didn't go to college to come sing pretty songs for white people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Can I say but, a little more about Asanda? Um, she, was, she wanted to be a doctor, at, but she accepted a job as a lab technician. She was the first black staff member at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And this is how she thought of herself as she wrote in her own book, a girl scientist working in a great white institution. Um, they were they were a real power couple at a time that that was rare. And she she had great respect for her own intellect, her own ability, and she put it all in the service of, of Paul's career for a long time. I don't think he would have achieved what he achieved in the world without her work. I think they were. Oh, no. Well, yeah, he definitely he, he says that, and, I, and that's covered as well in the show too, because uh, it's a it's a romantic um, uh, journey uh, of, of them together, you know, uh, and um, uh, uh, along the way because uh, when. She was at, um, it was a doctor in the emergency room that introduced him to her because um, she was the only colored person here. He had hurt his shoulder in a football game. And they couldn't pop back in at the stadium. They brought him to Columbia Presbyterian Hospital. And while he was in the waiting room, we saw her there. And, uh, and he was, they said, a doctor, you tell me, who's that pretty black nurse over there? And he said, that colored, she said, oh, no, she's not a nurse. Her name is Eslanda Gould. She's an analytical chemist. She works in our pathology department. The first Negro we've ever had in that capacity. Oh, she's quite bright. And then he met her. But she, when the doctor was introducing her, she said, Eslanda, I'd like you to meet one of our most famous athletes here in Harlem. She turned around, she dropped her clipboard, and she said, oh, my God, Jack Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, no, no, no. Paul <laughs> Wilson. And he was like, you know, and because um, uh, he would make uh, jokes about earlier, he made a joke that people would mistake him for Jack Johnson because they're both all oh, six foot three yeah. uh, uh, and stocky athletes, you know. And he'd go like, but Paul Robeson being mistaken for Jack Johnson? And he'd go yeah. like, Jack never looked this good. Romy <laughs> 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 just joshing you. Romy just joshing you. You know, and so it's, uh, but no, it was, um, it, it was a tremendous union. And uh, what people do not know is this. Eslanda died 14 years before Paul, but he got breast cancer. He retired, and he left Europe and came home so she can get treatment. Uh, it was Eslanda that told him, you know, uh, just get them to sing your song. And she, the first play that he got, he didn't audition for it. She went and volunteered him for it when a Broadway actor dropped out to go on a paying job. And so what happened, um when he did the show because the lady walked up to him and thanked him for saving her play and that was the first time he found out that he was actually in a play then Islanda told him you know she was at all the rehearsals to make him go there to everything and you know and that's covered as well but it, it was it's, it's a beautiful thing that but after she died paul never stepped on the stage in front of a mic sang or performed ever again that's right it was a huge loss for paul uh and Yes, Lambda, uh, there's a recent biography of her, so there's uh, she's really being resurrected uh, into the public arena again, as she properly deserves to be. She devoted a great deal of her uh, life uh, to promoting Paul. Uh, she was a tremendous catalyst to his career. She was the manager uh, in very basic way uh, to his artistic career. She pushed him. Uh, and uh, I think one has to acknowledge that uh, uh, they had, uh, it was a loving marriage, but a problematic one. Uh, and one, I think, has to be enormously honest about that relationship. Uh, Paul Robeson, for all of his magnificence, and uh, I've been uh, as vocal uh, on that as I can possibly be, uh, he was not necessarily the best husband in the world, not necessarily the best father in the world. Uh, he was, uh, because he was so enormously charismatic, so enormously attracted, attractive, uh, especially to women, uh, and because he was on the road so often, uh, he was involved uh, in uh, multiple relationships. Uh, Martin Duberman, in his uh, majestic and yeah. I definitive biography of Paul Robeson, goes into that, I think, in uh, more unnecessary detail, than, uh, than, than need be. Uh, but uh, notwithstanding that, uh, as Landa put up with a lot, uh, a whole lot, 
Uh, she also, I have to say, put up with uh, Paul Robeson's moodiness. Uh, and there was a substantial amount of that. Uh, I don't know that there's any definitive evidence of anything, but he was treated uh, near the end of his life uh, for uh, for some mental illness. Uh, and, uh, and that was not easy. That's never easy for a loved one to have to deal with. Uh, and she had to deal with it. Uh, and it provided, I think, substantial emotional burden on her while she herself was uh, dealing with significant uh, and ultimately terminal uh, illnesses. She is a remarkable woman, uh, a political activist uh, of significant and first-rate consequence of her own, and somebody who needs to be brought back into the arena uh, of major black women. You know, it's really good now that black women are taking center stage. That is tremendously important. We're on the verge of having the first black woman as a Supreme Court justice. That's useful. Uh, so I hope that that may be a catalyst to bring people like Eslanda Robeson back into the mainstream of history where she belongs. Absolutely. Dr. Von Bloom, um, um, one of our <laughs> folks, uh, folks have mentioned that, um, uh, that a lot is made about him. Uh, he was philandra and he did uh, have leading women around the world. But they said that he was so magnificently attractive because he spoke many languages. He spoke their language oftentimes better than them. And these were not just regular women, okay? This was Peggy Ashcroft, the I know. British actress, okay? I saw an old interview with Uta Hagen, the goddess of actress, the Meryl Streep of her day, in a David Cross interview where she talked about I had a three-year affair with Paul Robeson while we were doing Othello on Broadway, but it was um, Paul who initiated the affair. And I said, really, Uta Hagen? It was Paul because <laughs> it was a story about deception. And you were playing, uh, the whole Shakespearean play was about deception. The role of Iago was played by none other than Jose Ferrer, who at the time was freaking married to Uta Hagen. So I said, how did the three-year affair, the, 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 the life off stage was, matching the life on stage, how is that possible that this black man in the middle of the 1940s could have had this kind of an affair with you without you starting it? And you're at rehearsal every day and on stage with Iago. It is, it's about the same that was going on, except it was reversed a little bit. You know, and so I like uh, to throw out an idea and get your you guys' re reaction to it that I had while I was working on my research. Um, it's well known that Paul suffered what sometimes called a mental breakdown or some sort of brain injury or something later in life. It just happened at the time I was doing my research was also when everything was statistics were coming out about CTE that almost a hundred percent of football players have brain injuries from contact sports when they're young, and all the symptoms of what Paul experienced track exactly with the, the symptoms of CTE. And there's been so much made of whether it was a Freudian thing or a political thing or all these crazy complicated theories. But isn't it possible that in his long and violent football career, where they didn't have any kind of safety equipment, that poor Paul might have experienced the kind of a brain injury that later in life results in those symptoms? It just lined up so perfectly yeah, when I was reading possible. about this. Thing. He, only played, he only played two, three years. Uh, in football, but the thing is this too: um, the CIA and um, did give him uh, some uh, shock treatment, and there was some. Uh, they tried to poison him uh, in Russia. Um, uh, there were some things that happened that I've been told uh, when I'm abroad and in England that um, the things that happened that um, the CIA they tried tremendous things because he had tremendous, you know, uh, the resistance movement uh, with Josephine Baker and them in Paris and the whole thing. Um, the but his actual symptoms were more like the symptoms of brain injury. And I know people who took all that. They gave him LSD. Well, I know lots of people who took lots of LSD. They don't have the same symptoms as CTE. He had, he had electric shock treatment, okay? They slashed his wrist to make it look like it was suicide. There were a lot of things going on back then, and it was a very, very dangerous time. I mean, well, He was very ill for a long time. Yeah, we're getting around that. In 1968, okay? So it had to be dangerous, even 10 times more dangerous for Robeson in 1932, 1945. It had to be. It was dangerous, you know? The two most despised races on the planet Earth were Africans and Jews, okay? And ironically, they created 98% of the music that the world listens to, um, you know? But nonetheless, um, uh, those things, you know, um, 
there, there, there are contributing factors to it, you know, and uh, without a doubt. He saw a lot of dangers and the things that he was telling them he was experiencing and what they were finding out were, were more symptoms of brain injury than any of these other possible um, causes for, for his breakdown in well, later I, life. I, I remember we don't have any autopsy. I, I don't know that we can speculate with any uh, degree of accuracy on it. I don't know. I was just curious how you guys thought, if any, because I, 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 I tend to be skeptical of it. I tend to be skeptical of conspiratorial things. I, I detest the CIA. Uh, I have uh, every reason to believe that they've been a tremendously nefarious force uh, throughout much of American history. I doubt that they tried the poison ropes, and I think that they were up to more uh, substantial nefarious uh, things during that time. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I know I, uh, when I talked to Paul Robeson Jr., uh, that was his allegation. He also uh, attempted uh, to, uh, to commit suicide. I, I know uh, that uh, depression tends to have a genetic variable, but I'm no psychiatrist. Uh, I don't know uh, what all of that is. Um, I know that uh, my own speculation, and it is only that, was that he probably suffered from some variant of bipolar uh, disorder. Right. But what I know is this, that despite his episodes of depression, he rose to magnificent heights. During one of his most depressive times, he appeared before the House on american Activities Committee, and he pulled it together, and he gave the most defiant and eloquent uh, testimony uh, when he was grilled by those, how do I put it, monsters uh, in the House Un-American Activities Committee. And he gave the most eloquent and defiant statement against them. And he stood as a beacon uh, of light, a beacon of justice. Uh, and, uh, and he did that uh, in, in ways that uh, I, I use even now instructionally to show the students that they do not have to succumb the institutional oppression. Do you, I've read and included that when he went to make that appearance, uh, his family was so worried that he just wouldn't be in shape to speak up that Essie had a plan up till the end where she would suddenly faint and that would end the interrogation and spare him. And all of a sudden he rose to the occasion. And just as you're saying, I, I get shivers just thinking I listened to that speech and quoted those words. It, he was powerful, as powerful as he'd ever been. And what I included, what made, meant a lot to me, one of the doctors who examined him toward the end when he would have these terrible spells, you know, and just wander and be found in the park just lying there. He said, it's amazing that he stood and held up his strength this long, given what he had been through given all the uh, prejudice and attacks that he had been through, it was his strength that just was incredible, even at his lowest point. Whatever, yeah. go, whatever organic, I'll get you, John, whatever organic problem you've had, it was utterly exacerbated by the most significant, horrific oppression being brought down upon the blacklisting, uh, the attempt uh, by white America, white racism, to try to divide the black community and turn some of his erstwhile allies against him in utterly pernicious ways. I'm sorry, John. No, no, no. we're coming as, I'll sound like a therapist now. Well, group, we're coming <laughs> to the end of our time. Um, and just just thank you so much to everybody this is this has just been a beautiful conversation to listen in on i and uh if you have any final things what i'd like to do is if you guys have any final thoughts on uh on hmm. paul robeson and then what we're going to do is throw it to stoji to introduce his uh the uh, last clip the final journey i just want to say in light of the recent book banning that i hope that Stoji's video and that Sharon's books and my book and Paul, your books, I hope that they're not banned. If they are, I hope it gets a lot of attention so that you get publicity <laughs> and kids really read those books and get to know Paul Robeson. And thank you, John, for having us together. It's been wonderful. Yep.
Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Well, uh, my sense is that Robeson speaks to our time now, that he is one of the most magnificent models uh, for young people in particular uh, who want to live a vision of a life devoted uh, to social justice, especially for young artists who want to combine uh, their talent in whatever field to combine that with a vision saying the world is still a very bad place and I want to use my creative talents uh, in combination with using the, those talents with a vision of making this world a better place so that we can all finally move uh, to that world that is a better place for all human beings, not just the wealthiest one-tenth of one percent. That was Ropes' vision. We should honor it. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Uh, so um, uh, the, the final uh, voyage um, is, is the final scene from uh, what is a two-hour, normally a two-hour and 20-minute show with intermission. And um, it, it's, been, uh, it's been my passion piece. And, uh, and uh, well, what Dr. Von Bloom was saying was why I decided to become a teaching artist and use theater as a vehicle for social change, for upliftment, education, and to show the world uh, that we have this brief time on the planet Earth. That we Yes. And that we could um, accept each other and try to, you know, have a compassionate response to each other and treat each other with a little bit of kindness. It doesn't have to be love, but just kindness. But nonetheless, um, that is the final piece. This was a, a pandemic performance at uh, in New Orleans at the Jefferson Performing Arts Center at, uh, in New Orleans, Louisiana last year, Black History Month, around this time. And uh, they seat a thousand, they let 300 in uh, for this performance. And so, um, uh, this is it, my, my closing piece of my, uh, my passion piece on my mentor and uh, the man who changed my life, the legendary uh, Paul Wilson. I see. All of the bags are down in the limousine, just the one carry on. I have the passport. And we gotta hurry, honey, we don't wanna miss the ship. I know, baby. I'm sad too. Come on. Let me help you with your coat. When we got down to the docks. Over a thousand of our fans, friends, and extended family came to bid us farewell. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Gracias. Aliva dirty. Bonsoir. Adios. Gracias. and steered out across the dark Atlantic. I could feel the chill rising up out of the sea. The sea seemed hungry. And as I stood there alone and listened to the angry white waves as they lashed against the sides of the ship. And as I stood there alone and listened to the angry white waves as they lashed against the sides of the ship, I heard out there in the waves the cries and waves, wails of sick men, women, and children, slaves drowning after being tossed out into the sea. <laughs> There's a line in 
my Bible that speaks of the sea giving up its dead. Well, it had come to pass. The Atlantic was giving up its dead African slaves to me. A chill went through my body. And the voice in the spirit of my father's father, the old African, the Maasai, the Igbo, the Yoruba, the Kikuyu, the Ashanti, rose and spoke through me. Mine was the cruel kiss of the whip, the darkness, the burden of chains, the stench of the hole, the groans of the dying. And yes, 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 the hope of death. But still, I endured. I endured a symbol of their ultimate conquest. A black man, unforgivably black, bound in chains, being brought to the new world, to the loss of my own freedom, to build a world for the free of oh, America. I help build your world. But in the building, it became my tomb. In the building, it became Is there some way we can exit from this? Or?